Welcome to Sunday Night Live, the weekly online television magazine programme for Christians across the UK. And this week, running with fun and faith in today's London Marathon. Traumatised and homeless, welcoming in Afghan refugees. Saying thank you with art to our NHS and key workers. And how Psalm 23 won gold at the Chelsea Flower Show. Hello again from me, Pam Rhodes, welcoming you to another packed edition of Sunday Night Live. Lots going on, lots to talk about and plenty of great music coming up too. We do like a lively start, like this song from Nick and Becky Drake. They've drafted in a few friends to help with the singing and who knows, you might even find yourself singing along too.
How did you get on with all those actions? And of course, the title of that song, City on a Hill, comes as a quotation from the Gospel of Matthew about how a city on a hill cannot be hidden, just as we shouldn't hide our light and let it shine out in the darkness. Now, that is a quotation that's really inspiring for one of the 45,000 runners in today's London Marathon, Rowan Kali Chiran. He's clocking up his 50th marathon today. And before we hear from him, we're going to hear now from one of his fellow runners who's actually run even more marathons than Rohan. She is Sally Orange a very appropriate name because if you saw a crowd of runners, you would always be able to pick out Sally straight away, not because you recognise her face, but because she is always dressed up as a piece of fruit. Mm -hmm. That's what I said, fruit. I distinctly remember watching my very first London Marathon at the age of eight and thinking to myself, wow, I want to do that someday except it took me another 24 years until I actually plucked up the courage to go and do it. But once I'd done it, I felt a real sense of achievement. By setting yourself a small goal, whether that be a 5k, a 10k, maybe a half marathon, to work up perhaps to a full marathon, gives you something to aim for. Now, I've gone on to run over 60 marathons and I have a little small claim to fame that I'm actually the only person in the world that has ran a marathon on every continent dressed as a different piece of fruit. Yes, you heard that right. As my surname, as I said, is Sally Orange, and that really is my name. I realised that I could do something bigger with my running. And by running as fruit, people come and ask me why. And I tell them that I'm raising awareness for mental health. And that invariably, on many occasions, starts a conversation about mental health. Somebody might say that they've had a problem or they know somebody's had a problem. And it really subtly opens up that conversation. So my my why, my reason for running is much bigger. But actually, it's personal as well. So I'm passionate about mental health awareness because I have suffered myself and feel that it shouldn't be something that we're ashamed of, but actually something that we talk about so that it makes others realise it's really quite normal. So finding your why as to why you do these things is really, really important. And Sally's fellow runner, Rohan Kalicharan, has a very clear understanding of why he's run marathons in different cities around the world. And for him today, this London marathon is particularly special. It will be my 50th marathon. And that's a journey which gives me joy, which humbles and amazes me in equal measure. And perhaps what humbles me most on any given London Marathon Sunday is a thought of being part of this amazing collective of over 40,000 men and women, so many of whom are stepping way out of their comfort zone to do something they thought impossible. 40,000 people, all made, expertly crafted in God's image. How amazing is that? And perhaps the sad thing is that so few of them will know that they're made in God's image. So few of them will know of their inheritance. And that's why it's so important as a Christian runner that we really do shine, that we're set apart and that we are the city on the hill that Jesus talks about in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. I've often asked myself, what does it mean to run for Christ? I've spent so much of my life hiding from Christ, running from him, turning my back on him. And I was certainly never a runner. When I started this running journey in 2012, I was 20 stone. I couldn't run a bath, let alone run with my feet. But what I wanted to do was to help the charity that had saved my life. I'd lived with mental ill health over a period of time. And during that time, I'd attempted to take my life on three occasions. Mind were truly the mouthpiece of God on earth for me. They gave me hope. They gave me dignity. They saved my life. And through them, God was with me in the fire and the flood. 
and I always just wanted to give something back. I wanted to run 10 kilometers and raise 200 pounds. And uh, that was where it started. Among that, in the years, I've always looked for calling, for purpose. God, what do you want me to do which glorifies you? And I found him in the most unexpected place in running. And running truly has been a tool by which I've been able to help transform other lives. By fundraising in 49 marathons for Mind, the generosity of others have helped me to raise over £40,000. I've been involved in campaigns in changing perceptions around mental health, and I'm so humbled by that journey. And while I was looking for a tool to transform other lives, actually, the life transformed beyond recognition was my own. And in running, I've realised that in Christ, nothing is impossible. When I'm running, I have freedom. I have peace. When I'm running, I so hearly, I so clearly hear God's voice. And it's when I'm running that I really do feel his presence around me. When I'm running with perseverance, with my eyes fixed on the prize of Jesus Christ, that's when I know I can glorify God. We've recently been asked in a sermon series at Holy Trinity Clapham, what does God think of me? I know that God loves me and I know that his love is unconditional. He doesn't mind if I run, if I don't run, if I run a marathon in three hours, six hours, three days, whether I walk, whether I run, he just doesn't mind. But what he cares about is that I use the gifts that he's given me and that I do everything for God's glory because that's all that matters. Well, good luck to all the runners in today's London Marathon, not just with the running, but with the fundraising for good causes too, which is always such an important part of these events. But, you know, it is one thing to be running with a positive purpose and quite another to be running away in fear when your life and your home are suddenly in danger. There are so many heartfelt versions of that same story from Afghan families who have recently fled in fear from their homeland. Some of them have arrived here in the UK and churches across the country are responding in a variety of ways to the needs of these new refugees within their communities. So we're going to hear now what's been happening in the town of Luton from Joe Burke, the assistant priest of All Saints with St Peter. It started because of our relationship with the Red Cross and we got a, just got an email from them saying did we have any men's clothes, large size men's clothes, for an asylum seeker in a hotel that we knew and went in and said I've got some men's clothes, um, I hear you've got some asylum seekers here, we're from the church, can we help? I love my country because because I believed in love, faith, and hope. Because, because I had to. Because I had to present myself as another, as another man, with full of revenge and grudge. It, 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 it was not me. I couldn't do that. We live in a part of Luton which is 80% South Asian then with uh, a whole range, a whole mixture of other ethnicities, nationalities here as well. What we though became aware of was that two local hotels in our area were being used as what they called contingency hotels. These were uh, places where asylum seekers were being placed because the whole of the, the system for asylum seekers processing their applications had ground to a halt. The response was firstly to answer their requests for, for clothes and shoes and whatever they needed. And then they asked us if we could do English lessons. We kept trying to push at it and trying to find different ways to do it. And in the end, Care for Calais cracked it. Since starting the volunteering, we've tried to make connections with other organisations in the local area. 
and one of them um, was the church. And yeah, we've been working together ever, ever since we found each other. I got really depressed because uh, this uh, situation, you know, is too much bad situation about Corona. Just we stay in room. We don't have anything for do. But I hope uh, for future is uh, good. So I'm so aware that we've only just scraped the surface of, of their real needs. The biggest need at the moment that we can help with is boredom. People in hotels are simply stuck in hotel rooms, especially in strict lockdown. It's very much a waiting game for people. I mean, everyone's so keen to get on with their lives and sort of find some normality, be able to work and, and know where they're going to be in the longer term. I bumped into one of the asylum seekers at his hotel and he said to me, have you got anything to do at the church? We'd swapped numbers and I sent him a message saying, come on Friday. And I wasn't here that day, but David arranged for him to clear the, the allotments and I think do some work around here in the Peace Garden. And then the following Thursday, I think he came back and helped me sort through the clothes that we got at the back of church, helped set up the church for the service that we were just about to open up and do on Mothering Sunday. Things grew and it was simply a question of thinking, where am I going to be on that particular day? What can they do there? But yeah, I'd say my upbringing was really marked by the fact that like, I was an undocumented for a while and then a refugee and then an asylum seeker and now like a settled person. It's really helping my inner child. I think the reason why I go there is to say to myself that like, it's okay and that there's really no shame and to like, just show some goodness to people in that situation because I understand how degrading it can be. I think it's so easy when you learn about asylum seekers and refugees from the press, from social media, um, from what you see on, on BBC News, they seem like a different type of person. <laughs> and it's so blindingly obvious, of course, they're not. They're just human beings, exactly like you or me. I got a a WhatsApp message with a photograph attached three or four weeks ago and the photograph was just of mattresses on a floor and they had sheets over them and pillows and one duvet and this was the provision for a newly arrived family with two little girls and a baby. Their next door neighbours, refugees themselves, took them in that night, gave them dinner. Like, I personally believe that like God wanted us to make life as good as possible for everyone, no matter what their circumstances. It has to be about justice. For me personally, I think the church just needs to be more rebellious because I think that that's what Jesus was. Jesus was a rebel and he was about having difficult conversations and then taking those conversations further into action and changing the world. Start with the gospel. Start with the gospel. I mean, the, the Good Samaritan is the obvious one, Matthew 25. Um, I was hungry and you fed me. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. That's all you need. Just live it in whatever way is relevant to your setting and go and do it. And if you just live it, God will find you the ways to solve the problems and to find your way through it.
Well, for the last year and a half, we haven't been able to share love among us in the usual way because getting together in church or at other Christian events has been prohibited during the months of lockdown. Thank goodness that's all behind us now. The restrictions are lifted. And that means that wonderful national gatherings like the Christian Resources Exhibition can bring together people from all corners of the UK to a fantastic event starting this month on the 12th of October for three days at Sandown Park. And here to tell us what's in store is the Managing Director of CRE, Steve Goddard. CRE is a trade show for the church, a sort of ideal church show. So anybody who is involved in some way in managing a church, running a church, or cares about the future of their local church, CRE is the place to visit for all the resources you need. There are so many highlights of this exhibition, it's hard to focus on any really. There are so many, but in particular we're looking at the issue of how the church is coping with the post-pandemic situation it finds itself in. We're looking at financial resilience um, and, and we're looking at the way the church has responded through the digital area of live streaming. Many churches have gone for that to reach out to their communities when they've been unable to open their buildings. But what's the next stage? Where do we go from here? So this issue is being covered as well. But believe me, there are so many other areas uh, you'll need to go to the website to find out just what is happening over all three days. Still to come on Sunday Night Live, what faith means to this couple whose lives have both been affected by leprosy. The sculptures at Southwark Cathedral that thank our NHS carers and key workers. But first, some of the dearest words for any Christian to hear were written 3,000 years ago by a psalmist, Psalm 23, bringing comfort down the generations to so many who have felt that they were walking in the shadow of the valley of death. But those same words have inspired a beautiful garden initiated by the Bible Society that's been on display at this year's Chelsea Flower Show. So beautiful that it won gold. Hello, and welcome to the RHS Chelsea Flash Show 2021. My name is Hazel, and I am delighted to welcome you to the Psalm 23 Garden. It is sponsored by Bible Society and has been designed by the very wonderful Sarah Eberly. It's been an absolute success this week because people have stopped by and really, really loved it. People have been drawn in by the beauty of the garden. And then a lot of people have had really emotional experience of it. We've had loads of people in tears, great conversations, not just about the plants, but about um, people's experiences of the pandemic. Uh, a lot of people have been bereaved during that time, so have I. And this garden has uh, spoken to them in a really profound way, which we hoped it would, but it's great to see it actually happen. And I say that because we originally intended to bring the Psalm 23 garden to the Chelsea Flower Show last May. And as you'll probably know, the show was postponed until this May and then postponed again until September. So there were some pretty long days and nights where I really wondered if that we would ever, ever see this garden uh, become a reality. It was just a drawing and now it is the most exquisite thing. We have a wonderful waterfall, which you can see behind me, um, which draws a robin in uh, several times a day for, for a bath. And um, we have lots of wildlife coming in, loads of bees and butterflies and all kinds of creatures coming in and really enjoying the garden. Um, so it's just been a complete joy to see this beautiful place uh, touching the natural world and also touching people's lives. It has an on life. It isn't just here for eight days. After the show, it's going to be dismantled and then rebuilt and adapted for Winchester Hospice in Hampshire. It's going to be a beautiful destination for this garden to go because it speaks about the journey of all of life. And the people in the hospice, I hope it will um, speak to them in a really profound way and give them something lovely to experience at that stage in life's journey. 
but not just the patients, also their family and friends and the staff. If you haven't had the opportunity to see the Psalm 23 garden, you can catch us on the BBC, uh, on iPlayer, and there's loads to see on our website, which is psalm23garden.co.uk. One of the things that we really hope will happen is that people like you will be inspired to create community gardens on the theme of Psalm 23. We have a handy guide on the website which tells you how to do that. But frankly, every garden that you create will be different and we are so excited to see what they will be like over the next couple of years. So if you do create the garden, please let us know. Cathedral is playing host this week to a spectacular art and audio display called Gratitude. 51 statues, all from different designers in different regions of the country, highlighting the dedication of NHS carers and key workers during the pandemic months. And these statues are not just about saying thank you. They also reflect emotions and experiences that became very familiar over those times. Grief and fear, togetherness and hope. You know, it's not so unusual for local communities to want to thank the medical teams that have helped them through challenging times. The Dean of Southwark has been looking back at the story of a very special window in the cathedral, which was also a gift of art and gratitude many years ago. I'm standing in the north aisle of Southwark Cathedral alongside a window 
which was given by 670 grateful parishioners of the parish of St. Saviour's Southwark, which was the name of, of this cathedral before it became a cathedral, a window given in gratitude to the parish surgeon. And I, I'm standing here because it reminded me of the whole connection between the cathedral and medicine and the reason why we're so pleased to be able to welcome the Gratitude exhibition here. Gratitude is 51 images, the human image, decorated by artists from throughout the country, representing all those people, the staff of the NHS, key workers, who have been serving us during this pandemic over these last 18 months, serving us sacrificially, giving of themselves. 670 people contributed to the creation of this window out of gratitude for what they'd received from this parish surgeon. On this site, the Augustinian friars of the Priory of St Mary Overy decided that they wanted to respond to human need by establish, establishing a hospital. So they set up St Thomas's Hospital on this site. Now, of course, it's part of the world-famous Guy's and St Thomas's Hospital Trust. And we're very proud to be part of the history of medicine in this area. And so it's great that we're able to honour and give thanks to the people who have been serving this generation, just as those 670 parishioners were able to give thanks to the surgeon who had served them and their families. Gratitude is at the heart of what it means to be human. And you don't have to be a Christian, you don't have to be a person of faith in order to show gratitude. But there is something deep within the heart that needs to give thanks. So we're giving thanks to God for everything that our sisters and brothers um, in the NHS, who are, who are key workers, have been given to the whole of our society during this period. But that gratitude is bound up with that greater sense of gratitude that we have towards God and towards one another for all that we have received. And it's good as well to remember the generations before who were grateful to their medics, to their surgeons, to their nurses, and the 670 who wanted to say thank you to this surgeon. I'd like to introduce you now to a couple with a remarkable story to share. They are Dan and Babs Izzet. They are retired and living in Taunton now, although they've spent all of their lives in Zimbabwe, where Dan trained as a civil engineer. When they had been married for just two years, Dan was diagnosed with leprosy, a condition most often associated with severe poverty, which obviously wasn't the case for them. And so that diagnosis came as a great shock. Seven years on, Babs too contracted the condition, but her symptoms were picked up much earlier, so she wasn't affected anywhere near as badly as Dan. For him, leprosy has brought long years of pain and disability. It's had a major impact because of the late diagnosis. I was diagnosed with a very high level of Mycobacterium leprae in my body. At that time, the diagnosis was lepromatous leprosy, which is the highest level of, of distinction in, in leprosy. I'm anesthetic to my elbows, above my knees, and about 70% of my face is anesthetic. I don't feel heat or cold or pricks or anything. But that's dangerous, of course, isn't it? It is dangerous. As a result, I ended up with a leg amputation in 1980, having burnt my feet in 1977. Yeah. So it's been quite a, a challenge, hasn't it, to live with leprosy? It has been. We've had our challenges. Now, you two were both Christians, but I imagine that something like leprosy could make or shake the faith of anyone. What did it do to you, Dan? I made a commitment to serve the Lord at the age of five and a half. I can remember that clearly. I remember the message that pastor preached. I remember walking to the front of the church as was the practice of the church and giving my life to the Lord. I then took a detour round about the age of 11, 12 and was until Oh, 25 that I came, 24, 25 that I came back to the Lord. So Christianity has played a major role. I had wonderful Christian parents. My father died when I was very young, eight years old. But 
since then we have served the Lord with everything that we know. So was there a pivotal moment in your experience of leprosy when suddenly you had a real sense that God was in this with you? I was in hospital and I was in what they call a type 2 reaction. My face was all swollen up. It looked like I'd done about 10 rounds with Mike Tyson. They were all swollen up and I was in absolute agony and pain just sort of lying in hospital. It was just after lunch. And suddenly there was a white light in the room. I have no idea what it was and then how long it was. But then suddenly my pastor pitched up to visit me. And he said, what happened to you? I said, oh, I don't know. He says, you're different. So I sort of felt around and I still had all the lumps and bumps there. And we discussed it and he said, I, I think Jesus visited you. So I said, oh, wow, Jesus still visits lepers as in the old, olden days. Well, so that was sort of, I felt very happy about that. And then at visiting time, Babs came in and she stepped over the threshold. She says, what's happened to you? And I said, so, 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 I know, Jesus visited me. <laughs> What's your reaction to that, Babs? What did you see and how much effect has that had ever since? Well, he, to me, he, there was something like light about him. He just looked so different, although he was still the same, you know, with the, the swellings and on his face, there was just a different glow. And I just knew something must have happened. So what immediate effect did this have? Did it, for example, make you feel that you had a mission to share what you were going through with others, to come out, in other words? I think it was, but it was still many years after that, before we did come out. We wanted to tell our church first. And that really was the start of a, a ministry of mm. speaking out around the world, really. You're involved, aren't you, at international level in uh, spreading I, that message? We are. We have that privilege, yes. What do you do? Basically, we're retired now, so we're full-time advocacy work for people with leprosy. Has that taken you to other countries where you are in communities of people with leprosy, as opposed to being very isolated, as you have been through your experience? When, when we, we went to India, and there we met some of the leprosy sufferers, and the poverty, for me, the poverty was, it was overwhelming. I just, I just couldn't believe that these people were so poor and so dejected and rejected by their own families, by the people around them. It was just, it, for me, it was a very sad time mm. in India. So their experience of leprosy would have been very different to yours. Yeah, very, mm. very different. We, we just, we couldn't believe. We realised then how good God had been to us because it could have been so much worse. You had the money to pay for your treatment. Yeah, that's right. What was it like for you, Dan, um, going into those communities? How did they react to you, this white man coming to talk to them? Namaste. Do you see my hands? When I do that in India and say namaste, they immediately see my hands and every barrier disappears. Must have been very emotional for you. What did you do? I wanted to hug them. I can remember being in Banjaramasin and I, I went there, it was a Muslim group, and I said, What can I share with these people? I have so much more than what they have. But I just shared my life, tried to encourage them not to be ashamed of what's happened to them. It wasn't a sin. And afterwards, three men came to me and kissed me. Must have touched their lives. That's all that it's about. And now you want to touch other lives by getting the message. That's out it. to the world. What is that message? The message, first of all, to leprosy sufferers, don't let stigma control your life. I know in some communities it's extremely difficult because the community holds stigma against you. And that's a hard one to fight through because you're automatically rejected. But I also want to encourage people to be a person. You are a person. It doesn't matter whether you have leprosy. 
it doesn't matter whether you have disabilities. The impact it's had on my faith has been to make me more aware of what goes on in other people's lives and the importance of sharing Jesus with them. And especially with leprosy, because we both had leprosy, I've seen what Dan has been through. So if we can help people in the same situation in any way to understand the love of God, to understand the goodness of God, the healing power of God, and how he, he, he never rejects us. So we're always accepted by him, and it's been such a strong um, pull in our lives to be of use to the kingdom in, in serving others. We've never allowed our illnesses to define us. But what we have taken every single opportunity because of the illness to speak about what the Lord has done for us. To us, leprosy is a tool to extend the kingdom of God because of the adverse circumstances that are surrounded by it, it proves that we do serve a God of love, a God that sustains us in hard times and a God of great mercy and grace. Well, what a moving and inspiring story that is. But then Babs and Dan are a couple who are dedicating their lives to bringing hope to others by sharing what they themselves have been through. And as we draw today's programme to an end, hope is once again the theme of our prayers, which are brought to us by retired Bishop Mark Bryant, who's based up in the northeast of England. So from me, Pam Rhodes, until the next time we're together, I do hope that you will take care of yourselves and each other. Bye bye now. A prayer of hope. Father, thank you that in a world of despair, you are our hope. In a world of darkness, you are our light. In a world of sorrow, you are our joy. Help us to share the hope of our hearts with one another. Enable us to give hope to others through your work among us. Use us to transform our nation and to spread your hope to every corner. May our land flourish by the preaching of your word and the praising of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. a hope that burns within my heart it gives me strength for every passing day a glimpse of glory now revealed in me good part yet drives all doubt away I stand in Christ with sins forgiven and Christ in me the hope of heaven, my highest calling and my deepest joy to make his will my home. There is a hope that lifts my weary head, consolation strong against despair, that when the world has plunged me in its deepest pit, I find the Savior there The present suffering Future's fear He whispers courage in my ear For I am safe in everlasting arms And they will lead me home
is a hope that stands the test of time. It lifts my eyes beyond the beckoning grave to see the matchless beauty of a day divine. When I behold His face, when suffering ceases, sorrows die, and every longing. Satisfied, then joy unspeakable will flood my soul, for I am truly home. When suffering ceases, sorrows die, and every longing satisfied, then joy unspeakable will flood my soul. For I am truly home. And if you've enjoyed Sunday Night Live, don't forget to press the subscribe and like buttons so that your device will offer you future editions each week and recognize that this is a program of interest to you and others.